Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's quarterly webinar. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everybody will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the Q&A box located on your control bar. Presenters will answer questions at the end of the presentations. Here is today's agenda. Our guest presenters today are Russ Branzell, the CEO and President of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, Teresa Meadows, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Cook Children's Healthcare System, and Carl J. West, Chief Information Security Officer and Healthcare Strategist, KJW Ventures Incorporated. I'm your moderator, Al Faber, President and CEO of the Baldridge Foundation, and I will be moderating today's panel and questions and answers at the end of their presentation. Following the presentation, we will have updates from the Baldridge Performance Excellence Program by Bob Fangmeyer, the Director of the Baldridge Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence from Brian Lassiter, the Chair of the Alliance. And then I'll have a few closing remarks. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest presenter, Russ Branzell. Thanks very much, Al. What a pleasure to be here with uh, the Baldridge family as always, and uh, a, a special treat to share the stage, or at least virtual stage, with Teresa and Carl, two of the smartest people on the subject. And uh, I'm glad I get to ride their coattails a little bit on this as we talk a little bit about what's going on with cybersecurity and as we kind of post-pandemic world that we're in. Uh, without any doubt, as, as I get to travel around the world, if we can move to the next slide, um, as I get to travel around the world, uh, there is no doubt pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and as now we get closer and closer to being post-pandemic, cybersecurity is the number one issue that our members in Chime, uh, which is mostly made up of CIOs, chief information uh, officers, chief information security officers, and many others uh, in critical digital health roles, cybersecurity is their number one thing. Uh, even if they think they're doing well in it, it still keeps them up every night. It's the one thing that probably causes just a little bit of terror uh, in their lives because they're really good at their jobs. But this is one of those things where the bad guys out there, the bad people out there are always trying to get better uh, and make their lives less than ideal, to say the least. But as we look at this slide, really, we're going through these multiple ways. It didn't matter what wave of this pandemic you're going into, even if you consider us somewhere getting closer to post-pandemic, uh, the bad folks were always looking for opportunities here. And if there was anything we can say for sure, that really is the case. Now, next slide, please. Uh, Chime does a survey every single year uh, where we survey the entire, uh, not just membership, but entities around the globe. Uh, we call that our Digital Health Most Wired Survey. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, that, that survey has grown considerably. Uh, we took that program over out of partnership with the AHA. Uh, Chime really started running it in about 2018. And what we've seen is just a significant growth in the number of entities that are participating in this survey. Uh, and it's not just a technology survey. It is a overall digital health of an organization, how they're doing and their ability to improve. What I love about this, and, and great credit to, to Al in particular at the Baldridge Foundation, although this is not a specific criteria of the Baldridge program, in partnership, we've tried to build this to shadow and really kind of emulate the same methodology uh, that a Baldridge program has as we go along. But as you've seen, we've gone from just over 2,100, just under 2,200 uh, entities involved in this to over 30,000 in two years across the globe uh, and really in 14 countries. And one of the things we see without any doubt whatsoever is that cybersecurity is still the number one thing that they're working on, will continue to work on, and they see as one of their biggest threats. So if we can go to the next slide. This is just again, to give you an idea, you've probably seen a very similar model uh, as all you great Baldridge people out there pursuing excellence. Uh, we've built a very similar mindset in here. And as you can see, well, with a rare exception at the very top, uh, that have hit the highest level, very similar to receiving the wonderful piece of crystal at Baldridge, we all have a lot of work to do. Um, and we have a lot of work to continue to improve. And one of those areas that we specifically survey is cybersecurity and that overall preparedness. Next slide, please. Now, why is this such a big deal? And why is it such a big deal as we entered into the pandemic and really as we exit? 
because things like this, our survey has shown monumental increases in the use of technology connecting across multiple environments, and in some cases, not the most secure environments. People using FaceTime and other things to do telehealth. This is just one example of this huge increase of a consumer connection, which takes us from the traditional secure walls that Teresa and Carl are used to dealing with inside health systems to now all of a sudden the entire ecosystem is their frontier. Uh, every phone, every personal computer, even if it's still running Windows Vista or something else out there, they have to figure out what the security threat is. Next slide. And this is another example of that. We are engaging with patients. Our leaders are working with patients in ways we've never seen before. If you look at this entire list, and again, it's not intended for us to go over it, but every one of these involves a secure connection or a physical connection from an electronic perspective with patients out somewhere other than our traditional inside our walls of our hospital, which means every one of those creates a huge cyber threat, a huge cyber opportunity uh, for these bad folks that wanna work with us. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So the good news is, and this is good news, uh, we see organizations as part of that survey that we've done continue to improve in this arena. Uh, matter of fact, we see organizations in this case, year over year, the middle part of this little donut uh, shows those organizations with very deep comprehensive security programs that meet most or all of our criteria. Uh, organizations like Cook Children's, uh, Intermountain, where Carl just recently retired from. Those are organizations that have always been at the top of their game in this area. But just in a year's time frame, you see a huge increase from 24% of that, even though the, the overall number that we surveyed significantly improved, so did the overall percentages across the board. More and more cybersecurity is becoming a significant, significant player of workload for every, every place in healthcare. Now, most importantly, and unfortunately, what we still see is there's still a significant percentage of healthcare that are behind in having that comprehensive security program. Um, and that means we've got a lot of work. Next slide, please. Again, I don't mean this to be going through every single area. Here's some of the core components that we measure as part of our survey on there. The good news is if you look at this slide in every single area, every single area, it has improved year over year. And that is good for healthcare. We were probably behind in many other industries. Some would say we still are behind in healthcare. Uh, but I, what I will say is the focused effort of, of great leaders like Teresa and Carl in the health systems they've served are starting to show great progress as we see these numbers continue to improve. In some cases, year over year significantly improve, which means we can make the, the areas that we work in more and more secure every year. Next slide. Again, similarly here, as we look at those threats of those environments that we start working with and the ability for us to share information, which is the key to great healthcare and to work con collaboratively with those consumers out there, the patients and the families we're gonna wanna connect to. Again, we measure ourselves against multiple environments where we share. Again, this creates a little bit greater of a threat. The more you exchange electronically, the greater the threat. And this is where we're gonna have to hear some great leaders coming up. One more slide, please. Now, here's the good news and the bad news overall, and then I think I'm going to be turning this over to Teresa. And that is, if you look at this, and this is really just a bubble graph to show you year over year, small, year being la small dots being last year, uh, the bigger dots being this year's survey results. Uh, and what you can see is across the board, everything is approved. And if you remember, yellow being people with comprehensive programs and the blue being those without. And what we call this is, is really the cyber divide. We've all talked about really technology divide, uh, electronic divide, whatever you want to call it, for years in which environments, whether that's underserved in urban communities, rural, whatever, does not have, do not have access to the technology. The same is true with cyber. Uh, the larger entities, the larger resource entities are really doing well, but this cyber divide continues, continues to happen. And we're gonna have to do everything we can to get those blue dots actually to disappear and get everybody to a comprehensive program. So next slide. And again, this, I, I apologize, this is actually the final slide. And if I if, draw your attention to the uh, second from the bottom down here, this is where we saw in a most recent survey, just got completed a few weeks ago, where we asked our members, where do they see spending coming from? Meaning where are they gonna focus their attention and their resources? 
by far, if you look at this, especially with the whatever color you want to call that, I'll call it orange for the purpose of today, you add the orange and the blue line together as far as a focus of effort, everyone will be focusing on cybersecurity. Even if there's all the other work that needs to accomplish in a health system and continue to improve in a digital frontier, they have to make sure their security environment's most sound to begin with. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the wonderful Ms. Teresa Meadows, who is truly one of our cyber expert CIOs out in the industry, not just in our organization, but also in Washington. So Teresa, if we move to the next slide, I'll turn it over to you, Teresa. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Russ. Um, it is my pleasure uh, really to be here today and kind of talk about why healthcare. I think, you know, many times people think, why would, you know, why would healthcare be a target um, with us from a cybersecurity perspective. And so I want to give a little insight into some of the complexities of healthcare and why we seem to be a good target for cyber criminals. Uh, next slide. So healthcare is complex. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, participating in the healthcare cybersecurity uh, industry task force uh, in 2016, 2017. And we really did a deep dive about why is healthcare a target how can we improve cybersecurity and healthcare? And this is one of the things that really kind of drives, you know, the point home about healthcare. Healthcare is very diverse. Um, and as you know, in most industries, you don't have such diversity um, and you have, you know, patients and consumers really driving everything that you do. And so when people think about healthcare, they always think about the sort of the traditional healthcare uh, hospitals, doctor's offices. But if you start looking at the entire ecosystem of what healthcare really consists of, um, it drives a complexity that most industries really do not have to deal with on a regular basis. Therefore, making you know cybersecurity and protecting our organizations um, and protecting critical patient data and privacy uh, really quite complex. Next slide. And then you overlay sort of our regulatory environment. This is a, um, a great depiction of all the regulatory agencies that a healthcare institution will interact with pretty much on a pretty regular basis, um, some more than others. And, you know, the challenge within healthcare is a lot of these uh, regulatory agencies, sometimes their regulations conflict with each other. So, you know, we might be hearing, okay, we want to keep patients' data private. But on the other hand, we want to share patient data with everybody that we can share it with. So there's a lot of uh, conflicting information about how do we share data? Who do we share it with? What are the legal implications of that? What are the regulatory implications of that? And so, you know, the, the entities like the one that I work for are really responsible for understanding all of these regulations, uh, which really become quite complex. So when you combine sort of our environment and this regulatory environment, you could see where organizations have a hard time determining what they should do and when they should do it. Um, next slide. And then healthcare just has some really other unique factors. And this is uh, some of the assessment from our task force report. But there's just unique culture in healthcare. Our whole goal is to protect patient safety um, and ensure that we're providing quality care to our patients. And you know that unique culture sometimes drives us to share information in very specific ways or to um, want to protect information in very specific ways. Um, as Russ mentioned, you know, we're, we've been through rapid digital transformation over the last even five to seven years with meaningful use and really getting all um, of our healthcare entities automated on electronic health records. And that, that rapid transformation, we did not really consider all the cybersecurity implications of that transformation. Um, we talked about the regulatory environment. Organization size varies, and these rules and regulations apply to a single doc practice all the way up to, you know, multi-billion dollar healthcare organizations. And so, you know, what I have the ability to do at Cook Children's, a single doctor's office may or may not have the ability to do those things and protect the organization. Um, patient safety is really unique factor. We're the only, you know, uh, industry where we could potentially harm or even kill a person if a cybersecurity event were to occur. And so have, making sure that we're able to provide adequate care is really important through these, these trying, times that we have. Um, and just lack of skilled resources. Uh, most healthcare is nonprofit. And so us trying to find skilled cybersecurity resources and really compete with other industries to get the best talent is very difficult um, when we have very small budgets and margins that we're trying to meet. Next slide. 
as we talk about, you know, post pandemic, this, these are all things that happened during just the one year of the pandemic around cybersecurity. Um, the uh, bad guys really ramped it up uh, during uh, the pandemic because they knew that we were preoccupied with ensuring that we were providing the best patient care uh, to our patients. And so um, one great example, um, there were a lot of applications that were developed to do contact tracing for COVID. Uh, one of the very first applications that was developed actually was a malicious piece of software to actually begin gathering information about uh, COVID-19 patients and then how do we how it was going to get that data. And that was early on in the pandemic. If you can see that particular one was in July of 2020. Um, there was actually a World Health Organization study that showed, you know, a five-fold increase in cyber attacks. Um, there was a direct correlation to the number of COVID cases as COVID cases increased, so did cyber activity. And so we really saw a lot more cyber activity during the pandemic than we traditionally expected. And many, many organizations were uh, really distracted. So you can see um, in that top quote, there were 132 more breaches uh, during this time frame than there were the previous year, which is pretty much a 50% increase um, in reporting breaches just during a, a five month period at the very beginning of the pandemic. Next slide. You know, what are our most prevalent threats? You know, in healthcare, we're probably most susceptible to phishing attacks where people are sending email requests, people misinterpret the email request and they actually end up sharing either critical information or, um, you know, personal information, which then allows the bad guys to get into our systems. Um, you see in the media a lot, ransomware attacks where uh, people are asking for money to release our data back to our uh, institutions. And these probably get the most press. Um, a lot of ransomware starts with phishing. And so you'll see, um, you'll, you'll see the ransomware probably get the most um, press activity, but those are some of the uh, issues that we experience the most. Uh, loss and theft of data and equipment still occurs within healthcare where people, a laptop might go missing or someone in home health uh, loses their laptop while they're out traveling, those types of things um, continue to be threats. We have uh, instituted a lot of in, insider training uh, for our workforce because uh, sometimes uh, data gets lost and it's accidental because it's just part of the normal workings of an organization. And then sometimes we have insiders who want to use that data for uh, personal gain. So we have a lot of internal uh, evaluation and technology that we use to kind of monitor our own workforces. Um, and then last but not least, medical devices have really been a hot topic today uh, with interoperability. Most medical devices are connected to our networks um, and most medical devices are very old. So they weren't designed to have all the uh, current day protections from a cyber perspective. And so there's been a lot of work in the industry about how do we improve medical devices and medical device security. Next slide. Yeah, and if, if the pandemic wasn't uh, bad enough in November, we actually, for the first time, I think, at least in my history, we were actually notified from a federal agency that, that uh, we had increased an imminent cyber threat to, to healthcare as a whole. Um, this is where we really partnered for the first time with our federal counterparts to really be on the lookout for cyber activities. Um, and what you saw is lots of organizations kind of batting, you know, batting down the hatches and working closely um, with the FBI and HHS and NIST and our uh, CISA counterparts to really ensure that we're protecting healthcare. Um, we, I think this was a, a wonderful step in the right direction um, with the partnership that we've had with the, with the federal government and really getting information out to healthcare. Next slide. And people always ask, you know, why, why healthcare? Um, a medical record um, is worth 10 times more than a credit card. And people always go, why is that? Um, for one, the data is not easily changed. So when I acquire medical record data, it's not something that's gonna change very often, so I can use it over and over. Um, typically, the data is very high quality and it's deeply personal. So when I take somebody's diagnosis or their um, 
you know, their insurance information, that's very personal to an individual. And so it can be used for insurance fraud, credit card fraud. Um, it can be used to obtain uh, prescription drugs, which then can be resold on the market. Um, a lot of overseas uh, intelligence agencies try to get the, inform the medical information of our uh, leadership and government or in critical institutions where research is being done. And then they can use that, that information for different purposes, whether that's blackmail or other, other nefarious uh, activities. And so it's really important to, to know that medical record data can really be used in a lot of different ways for a lot of different uh, criminal activity. And what we see with, especially in pediatrics is that you know, a, a child's medical record can be used multiple, multiple, multiple times because as the child grows and ages, more data is collected and they can use that same identity over and over and over. Next slide. So some of the things in healthcare that we're concerned about is if we have a cybersecurity attack in our organization, we could impact um, competition, our reputation, the culture of the organization, and the financial viability of the organization. So if we were to suffer a cybersecurity attack or ransomware, we could lose you know, the faith that or our patients have in us in providing safe quality care. And so we really try to reduce as much of this risk as possible because any one of these factors could actually put a, a healthcare organization uh, out of business or really hurt their reputation in the community. Next slide. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Car Carl. Uh, many of our goals um, in cybersecurity preparedness really focus on these things. We wanna make sure that we keep our information confidential and private. We wanna ensure the integrity. So if we were to experience a cybersecurity attack where somebody modified data, then we would not know if the integrity of that data is good and could we provide adequate patient care. Availability is important because it's really hard to provide care without the data available to us. And then the number one reason we want to have preparedness is really patient safety. We want to ensure that that cute little kiddo uh, in that picture is not going to experience any negative outcome because we didn't have the data available or the data was wrong or we didn't keep something confidential that needed to happen. And so Carl's really gonna kind of walk us through what organizations can do to, to, to maintain these types of things in their organization. Thank you, Teresa and Russ. And I, I am honored to join this group today. And I, I think um, what I hope to do is put into perspective, Russ and Teresa have shared little bit about what just happened and uh, the impacts. I'd like to share more details about how that affected cybersecurity and, and then spend some time and talk about, um, as Russ mentioned, a comprehensive program that we, we all need to be building after COVID and, and what changed, how do you do that? And I think there's a number of things that, that, that can help us uh, in this from um, a capabilities and a maturity model that NIST has provided that's, uh, that's really engineered and designed to do some of the things that Russ was just sharing with you. Measure your capability, improve that capability, look at the maturity, and, and NIST has built a very good program around that. And then certainly the work that's been going on in Washington that Teresa was a part of, and certainly I was a part of with 405D, those are efforts that I'll like to talk about as we talk about how do you build and what do you do in a program. If we look just specifically at COVID and what just happened and Teresa alluded to the increase in breaches, let me just share you, if you went out and looked at HHS's uh, website, what you'll see is the greatest source of breach in 2020, the threat vector that, that was avenue that was used most was third party breach. Now that's a new thing that we haven't addressed before. Certainly the fish attacks were the source of those third party breaches, but that's a thing we've got to pay attention to. That's a new vector and a new threat that uh, we haven't been as aware of. And certainly in organizations that I've been involved with, people are asking the question, what, what does this mean? We're signing partnerships. It's part of the new digital transformation. It's part of consumerization. We've got to have more partners. How do we prevent? We've built a nice program, like Russ said. 
what about our third party? So I'm going to talk about what do you have to do now? And uh, this third party breach is a significant change that occurred in COVID in the middle of the things that we were dealing with. I, I think a couple of other things to be aware of, the, the healthcare transformation has been in the works for three to five years. Most progressive healthcare organizations have been aware, been focusing on an ability to change, to deliver any person, any place, any time capabilities. Well, COVID forced that on us, ready or not, here we are. And a suggestion, a tip I'll give to our listeners today is, take a look back at COVID and everything that you changed with the relaxed guidance that came from HHS, make sure you create a COVID risk register. Keep track of every change you made and whether it's something you want to continue or something you need to fix and shore up at the end, be aware of that, measure and monitor that risk. But this, this transformation has been accelerated and I've heard a number of healthcare CEA, CEOs say, see, we can do it, we can move quickly, we can move fast. And, and I think that's a tip and a trip, a trick I'm going to share with you. For us to build some successful programs, we have to become enablers. This notion that I list here about relevance is what is facing everyone in healthcare. It's the idea of we've been here, we have bricks and mortar, but the future is changing. And there are disruptors to healthcare who are actively trying to find a way in and COVID has opened that door so that many organizations like Amazon and JP Stanley Morgan and Walgreens and Walmart and CVS and Aetna, and there are many others who are looking, how can we have an opportunity and jump in? So the concept of relevance that I want us all to understand, if you're a cyber leader, if you can't enable the business to, to transform and enable consumerization and remote any person, any place, any time access, your business may become irrelevant. And it reminds me as I look at it as what has happened to Kmart? What, has, what is happening to a Walmart with an Amazon? What happened to the Swiss watchmakers? That's the story of relevance and we have to be aware of it. And as cyber leaders, we have to develop ideas around how to enable, how to reduce the friction, and, and how to become enablers versus barriers. As, as I list here a couple of other things, um, solar winds and black bots, some events that have just happened that have to do with threat, vulnerability, and a cyber attack. Those are things that as we look to build a program, we have to realize that these, increase, these increasing attacks are having an increase in complexity and an increase in the ability to do damage to our organization. Let me just share a quick example around that. In, in the space of detection, 30, 40% of what we do in the detection space needs to shift away from traditional models because we have moved from a traditional model as Russ outlined. In that traditional model, I could use the perimeter and rely on it. I could use all of my endpoint, all of my signature-based solutions. But in this new environment, those signature-based controls need to be shifting to new abilities, new capabilities that are gonna change how we do and what we do. The segmentation that we had put together of the past focused on internal, but this new model with users anywhere in their homes and many of the users were aware were mobile and moving through COVID taking advantage of the opportunities. So our responsibility now of protection has much less to do with the geolocation, more to do with the identity, more to do with the role and the segmentation now begins with understanding crown jewels, understanding identity, building analytics to help us to move away from the signature, the perimeter, the endpoint that was very traditional into the new remote, any person, any place, any time environment. And really, I'm gonna come back to this when I give you some suggestions for a program, but the identity becomes the key to this new cybersecurity future based on everything that's changed. Let's switch to next slide, please. 
So I've started to, to talk about these things, these concepts that are listed here, but much of the friction in the member, patient, even physician and nurse experience is directed and targeted at cybersecurity. And Teresa and I have talked about this in the past, how cybersecurity takes the blame and we need to own that blame, especially with our 25 character passwords. And by the way, NIST is telling us that eight characters are okay. And why don't we shift? Well, at, at Intermountain, we did. We listened to NIST, we meet with them. We uh, appreciate the research, the studies that tell us that a 25 character password is just as easy to steal on the internet as the eight character password or a two character password for that matter. So a matter of friction is introduced when I put that 25 character password in front of the physicians and identi identity management that is replicated on every system creates additional risk. So all of these kinds of things, that's an example I'll just share with you and the ideas of the future that I'll talk to you about in just a minute and what to build, start to revolve around machine learning and artificial intelligence and finding ways to do in a frictionless way what has been very friction filled for our caregivers and our care delivery people. The idea of zero trust is uh, a natural outcome of what has just occurred and what happened to us. Organizations are beginning to pursue zero trust principles to help to address the changing security requirements that are associated with remote and expanding workforces. Certainly the any person, any place, any time model is going to require us to shift to the cloud. I can't do everything for a patient who wants to be anywhere inside a locked down perimeter. And the physician who wants to be mobile is going to be difficult to serve inside the four walls because the physicians want to be mobile. I had a group, as an example, a group of radiologists who came and said, we'd like to do our work from and, and they named an offshore location. And as I sat to talk with them about how to do that, I really realized that's the future. It's the opportunity for us to break the barriers based on what has just happened. And this notion of zero trust, most security teams in the past relied on a trust but verify or a defense in depth kind of an approach. But really what zero trust says is, start with never trusting, build the security around a model that challenges all identity, all access, all, in, all network and everything that happens in the organization. And at the same time you're doing that, the model we build has to come to be a comprehensive approach that involves new broad enterprise approaches. The identity of the past that was clinical only will not be successful because the identities that are being breached are partner identities or they're over in food services or they're over in uh, research. All identities have to be comprehended, brought into one broad enterprise management strategy. So let me just um, shift and let's go to our next slide. And, and this is where I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes and share with you if I were looking right now and let's say you're one of those people that Russ was highlighting that has built a successful program. What do you need to do now different as a result of COVID? And if, by the way, you didn't have that successful program, what are some things that you could do to, to shore up your program? First, I, I'm going to list eight or 10 things, uh, my top 10 list, I think. But first, a couple of just recommendations. Start, as I said, with NIST. They have a comprehensive uh, identify, detect, protect, respond, recovery framework that can be built in. And they have all the governance elements that, in fact, we at Intermountain were using to base every risk and every remediation program around. Um, in addition, the 405D, the, the hiccup program, as we like to call it, which is that uh, health industry cybersecurity practices program, where we try to define what are best practices in every area. Those are some places where you can start and look at the threats and the uh, protection publications that, that uh, 405D has put out. Um, I, I think another key before I go through the top 10, make sure that as you do 
whatever changes you're going to do, make sure you're working with senior leaders like Teresa, like the CMO, the CNO, the CFO, because anything you change is going to become either an enabler or a barrier to the organization who's trying also to respond to just what happened to care practices and to the efficient and safe delivery of care. Those are so critical. And so to be successful, to not have your cyber program get shut down, you've got to be partnering with those leaders, understanding their issues and risks from a business perspective, and then building what you do to map to that kind of an environment. I'll, I'll have one other suggestion about how to do that in a real way in just a minute. So let me shift on the how do you do that then? First, I would start with, based on what I just shared, number one, establish a cyber governance committee and organization. That should involve the Teresa's, the CIOs, the CMO, the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, the chief operating officer, chief compliance officer, chief innovation and chief strategy. Those are some suggestions. Your may, organization may be different than another one. You probably we should also include legal. That's first suggestion. Get a governance committee. Those are people who you can educate, who can become your advocates, your champions in the program. If they are determining the risk in the program, you will be successful. Successful. If you as a CISO dictate the risk, you will find failure. Number two, determine the risk and the risk tolerance for the organization. Again, if the tolerance for risk is determined by the CISO, you will have some failures. If the tolerance for risk is determined by leadership and a governance committee, like I mentioned, you will develop a successful risk management program that's got to include everything from mitigation to avoidance to transfer to the exception, acceptance of risk. A governance committee with their understanding, their role is to determine the risk and the appropriate level of funding. That's what's created great success for me and I share it with you as a tip. Third, start and develop with an inventory of data. Now, how do you do that? You start with the things you know. It's hard to know data. That's hard to quantify and figure out. But if you start, you do know all your endpoints. You do know all your servers. You do know all of your applications, your network, your mobile devices, your medical devices. If you built all that right up front into a quick spreadsheet and inventory, and then if you sat down with your CMO, who by now, because you have a governance committee with she or he, you can say, Dr. Breesacker, tell me, what does care delivery look like in the EMR? What does it look like in radiology? When they describe that to you, you now have data inventory. You know where the data resides. You know where it moves. You know how it gets accessed. That's what we need to have. That's a regulatory requirement coming from HHS. You now understand the patterns for access, the motion, and the storage of the data. Put together with that a risk and data classification strategy for your inventory. Fourth item, review all the policies. All your policies are in place pre-COVID, pre-transformation, pre-remote and, and cloud need to be revisited. Everything has to be mapped to the new environment. And I, and I made a comment about looking at your COVID risk register. Let me tell you about policies. Policy needs to link upwards to strategy. If it does not, you're going to have failure. If you create your cyber policies independent of the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, the chief financial officer, and they go a different way, your policies will fail. So link your policies upward to strategy, downward to NIST-based technical controls. Everything you've defined in your NIST, uh, they have a common security framework you link down to all of those things, create a map, map it, and NIST is mapped very well right back to the HHS requirements and our privacy and security regu regulations. So that becomes my next suggestions uh, and, and suggestion, and it's this um, policy and policy mapping. Then the next thing you have to do is number five, review your architecture, take a look at what changed in COVID, create remote, any person, any place, any time access capabilities that has to change 
uh, be a change from what you have and it has to change in your architecture. You have to comprehend that the perimeter is now largely lost. It needs to change. You maybe need to do reverse per perimeter. You need to extend it through reverse proxy. Maybe you need to look at your VPN, your VDI. Also likely going to be successful only if you're able to embrace and create many new cloud partners. So this is about reviewing architecture and it's what it's meaning is in my mind, mapping controls right down to the new technology, the new architecture, the new vulnerability process that includes uh, new technologies. And certainly you've got to have, as you look at this architecture, you've got to have good, strong uh, zero tolerance um, endpoint controls, server controls, patch vulnerability management, strong sandbox technologies to, as uh, Teresa was talking about, all the issues that are occurring associated with fish, get a strong sandbox technology, spam eliminating technology, make it easier for the business. Also make sure in this architecture, you have the preparation for the ransomware, which is business continuity and data recovery plans. Most organizations aren't prepared and that's what then affects what they're able to do. I think number six, I would tell you, make sure you have good incident response, detection, response and recovery. Three pieces that I mentioned, those three pieces are part of what's defined in NIST. And if you think of them as the same thing, you will fail. In fact, many of the organizations that are struggling in COVID and in this breach environment, jump from detection where they've just discovered an element of a ransomware event that occurred and they don't know how broad it has gone. They don't know everything that has occurred and they go right to recovery, not understanding what needs to happen and the carefully defined detection processes to make sure you know everything, then the responses to what has occurred and then the recovery to a normal uh, state. This misunderstanding can create some critical issues in your recovery. Number seven is identity. And I've mentioned that the perimeter is lost. You need to, as part of what you're doing to build uh, an identity program, make sure that comprehends all identities. Number eight, take a look at third-party risk management. You need to have a risk uh, inventory for third parties with detailed plans how to isolate to protect to respond to that. And number nine, because of the, the increased attacks, we need to move to this zero tolerance. And finally, last but not least, my challenge to you is remember how important enabling the business is and relevance is make sure that what you're doing introduces a reduction in friction and an increase in enablement of the business. So let's part, pause there and see if there are some questions. Now we'll turn it back over to you. If we have Al. Okay, I got a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one is, could you explain the preparedness differences between large systems and smaller facilities? The, the differences in the approach that you take. I, oh, do you I, want to take the first shot at that, please? Yeah, I, I can start and just suggest that um, in, in general, if you looked at a NIST maturity scale, they're going to fall. Those uh, small organizations, typically under $2 billion, are going to small it, fall into a maturity rating with NIST that is um, in the bottom 20% of capability and maturity. And that means everything from the, the tools, the processes, the technologies, the capabilities they've developed far below what Russ outlined, and then their maturity, that is their ability to repeatedly execute consistently is also going to be significantly lower. And, and as you come up into the large organizations, they're going to be those ones that are up in, like, like Russ was showing, up in that top uh, 20, 30% of capability and maturity that's out there. What I, what I will add to that is we don't think it's a lack of knowledge in many cases. I think exactly what Carl has laid out, most of these smaller organizations know that that's what they need to do. 
in many cases, it's an access to two things. It's human capital, meaning the resources to be able to do this, and the fiscal capital, the money to be able to scale to the same size as a, a Cook Children's, an Intermountain, you know, other large health systems. It's the same requirement, but nowhere near the same ability to execute based on resource uh, accessibility. Lisa, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, th I think Russ is right on. If you if you think about um, traditional small physician practice, they probably don't even have an IT department. Usually, the you know if you looked at that practice, their IT person might be a nurse in that practice, or it could be someone like that. And so, there really is just a, a wide range of capabilities. And so, you know, one of the things that we've really been advocating for is the ability for larger organizations like mine or Carl's to be able to assist some of those smaller organizations since we are, you know, really connecting to them and sharing data and, and getting more interoperability with those small organizations, having ability to, to help them with their cyber security processes, whether that's people or process or even technology. Has, was a huge win for us over the last, you know, year with some modifications in the Stark Law. So I think, um, you know, the, the industry as a whole is really surrounding some of the smaller organizations and having that ability to support them um, is really how we succeed longer term um, through this process. Uh, our next question is, uh, Carl, uh, directly towards you. You mentioned that the CISO could not or should not define the risk appetite. Why is that? And how would the risk process fail if the CISO does define it? Creates great tension in an organization. And I've seen it uh, many organizations that I've gone in and talked to, looked at. What you'll start to see is friction and tension where there's disagreement between what the CISO is trying to do and what the CMO is trying to do or what our imaging product is wanting to do. And, and literally that tension comes from misalignment of goals. And if we take a look at what are the business goals and then find how do I enable that at the same time protecting, it really becomes, what do we put first? And I would put first, what is the business what is it the chief nursing officer wants to do? What is it the chief medical officer wants to do? As opposed to coming and telling them, here's the 10 things I need you to do or we won't be safe. If I can find out what they need to do, I can find ways to protect that. There are many different ways to do the things that are implemented. And just as Teresa was sharing, what 405D was about was putting together ways to share those best practices. In 2015, the Cyber Information Sharing Act was put forth. And if we take advantage of that, that's a way that organizations large and small can share, how did you help enable consumerization? What did you do different? And that's how we can accomplish that, reduce that tension that exists naturally in an organization. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add to give you, since I don't sit in the CISO role, to give you an example. So, um, we have a physician who is doing a lot of work um, in studying gait and neuro issues in children. And there are only two gait lab products on the market. Um, and we really wanted to have a gait lab in our institution. Both of those gait lab products, neither of them had the appropriate cybersecurity controls built into those products. And so a CISO could go one of two ways. So you, to Carl's point, the CISO could have said, sorry, you can't buy either of those products because they're not going to meet our criteria. Um, but the business really wants to provide that care to those, those children. And so sometimes the CISO has to say, okay, here's the risks and here's how we can mitigate those risks versus saying no. And I think that's where a lot of the security officers fall in this trap where they're trying to enforce either rules or process, but the business really needs to continue. And that's where Carl is saying, you know, understanding the business and how important that service line is to patient care. Sometimes you have to be creative 
and you can't do exactly what you how you would want to do it but there are other ways to architect a secure solution um, for so that you can provide that care and so that's a great example we had that at our organization and you know your first inclination is no we're not doing it and and really you need to find a way to say yes but this is how yeah Teresa that is a perfect example and it really becomes to the question don't say no go tell me another way to do it that is secure because the CMO, the CNO, no one wants to be in uh, risk of not protecting the data. Find us a way to do it. Don't tell us no. Okay. Uh, our next question is, please speak to, please speak about the role of the cyber assessment or audit by an outside party the necessity, content, frequency, et cetera. Is this mandatory for a best-in-class organization? Uh, should or does Safe Harbor require such an assess assessment? You know, I can speak to my, uh, this is probably more of a personal opinion than a, um, you know, maybe a directive by some agency, but I think it's always good to have self-evaluation by an external entity. And so uh, for things like PCI compliance, we are required to have an external assessment to ensure that we're, being, we're compliant with some of the payment card industry best practices. Um, we actually have a process at Cook Children's where we have internal assessment by our internal audit, and then annually we have external assessment for certain processes, and that's how you improve. So I think it's really important to have those external processes uh, put in place so that you can get a third eye on what you're doing and, and get it get constructive feedback into how do you improve your program. Um, sometimes you're just too close to how the program is is being developed and having that unbiased third party give you give you feedback is really important in your ongoing development and maturity models um, as you move up the you know the maturity model from a cybersecurity perspective. And, and I might just add um... To, directly to your question, is it required? No, an external assessment is not required. And I've sat with HHS, asked that question directly. They would love to see it. It's difficult to enforce. I, and then I would answer uh, the thing I would tell you about self-assessment is there are lies, dirty lies, and then there's self-assessment. And it's the worst of all of them. And I'll tell you in the assessments I've seen, some organizations do a self-assessment on a NIST scale. They put themselves higher than we know anyone is. Russ has been benchmarking this. We know they're not as high as they claim to be. I saw one organization who claimed perfection and yet they really fit in the small. So this, this notion and idea of at some point, whether it's every two years, every four years, get an external assessment like Teresa said, get some other eyes on it so that you're not just patting yourself on the back saying we have a great program and then you're stunned when something happens. So Al, we probably need to turn the time back over to you all to complete the rest of the agenda. We probably took a little too much time, but thanks for letting us share. And, and most importantly, thanks for Bob and, and Al, everything you do to, to make us better in this country. And we especially appreciate our friends over at NIST that continue to help us in this tough area. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, uh, Carl, Teresa, and Russ for a very informative uh, discussion here and uh, great presentations. And so uh, you're correct. We're going to turn it over to Bob now for an update from the Baldrige program. Bob? All right. Thanks, Al. And I also want to add my thanks to Russ and Teresa and Carl for sharing your insights and your expertise. Very valuable. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief, but uh, I want to start with a little refresher. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, most of you know the Baldrige program is a 33-year-old public-private partnership. We're housed within NIST, and we're part of the Department of Commerce. And our purpose is to improve the performance and competitiveness of organizations of all kinds, so as to improve our national competitiveness. And we have a three-pronged mission in order to accomplish that. We establish and maintain a nationally and globally recognized standard of excellence, the Baldrige Excellence Framework. We identify role model organizations that perform very well against that standard, and that is the Baldrige Award process. And we foster the use of that standard and the sharing of the best practices of those role model organizations through everything else we do. 
which includes supporting our partners such as the Baldrige Foundation and the Alliance for Performance Excellence, among others. We also provide a variety of educational improvement tools and offerings. And in fact, if you haven't seen it yet, I would strongly encourage you to go check out the information on our Quest for Excellence conference that's happening in two weeks. And I would encourage you to register. There is a tremendous opportunity to learn through that offering. Next slide, please. So the Baldrige framework is the center really of just about everything to do with Baldrige. And so it's very imperative that we ensure that the framework is a valuable and effective tool. And one way we work to make sure that that is the case is by having a regular cycle of revision and improvement every two years. Our overarching goal is that the framework and criteria for performance excellence remain at the leading edge of validated leadership and performance practices across all aspects that are critical to an organization's success and sustainability. And by the way, that includes cybersecurity. In addition, we explicitly strive to ensure that the framework remains relevant, easy to use, and concise. Having a technically perfect framework is of little value if no one wants to pick it up and use it. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of some of the types of changes that occur with the revisions to ensure the relevance of the framework. And shown here are the major changes for the new version that was released this past January. I'm not gonna dive into these, but I just wanna point out that in most cases, the concepts that were added are built upon content that was already a part of the framework. For example, organizational resilience was explicitly added in a number of areas across leadership, strategy, workforce, and operations, building upon our emphasis around organizational agility and business continuity. In addition, we added equity and inclusivity to our emphasis on diversity and valuing people. And in case you're wondering, although it wasn't called cybersecurity, protecting data, information, and information systems was added as far back as 2001. Next slide, please. So beyond updating the framework, we also look to find ways that Baldridge can help address various national needs. And here you can see the expansion from our focus on improving businesses to improving healthcare, education, and nonprofits as well. And in more recent years, we have partnered with the Communities of Excellence 2026 initiative to develop a Baldridge-based approach to improving entire communities. And in partnership with NIST's Applied Cybersecurity Division and industry, uh, we developed the Baldridge Cybersecurity Excellence Builder, which is an assessment tool that combines the NIST cybersecurity framework with an abridged version of the Baldridge framework. We are currently working with various partners to develop an award program for excellence in workforce development, which we actually ran one last year, and now we're trying to update it for the new administration. And we are developing an assessment for manufacturers to determine their preparedness for an adoption of advanced manufacturing industry 4.0 technology solutions. You can pick the term that works best for you. So I'll stop there. If you should have any questions about any of these things, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll turn it back over to Al. Brian Lassiter, the chair of the Alliance for Performance Excellence from a update from the Alliance, Brian. Thanks Al. Um, I'll be very brief in the interest of time, just two slides if we go to the next one. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Alliance for Performance Excellence is the national network of all the Baldrige based programs in the United States that essentially feeds the national program that Bob just talked about. So we currently represent 29 programs serving all 50 states and US territories. And then we also have five supporting members which is a new classification for us last year. You'll see some of the statistics there. I'll mention that our annual applications is uh, new data that just came in last month is essentially flat from uh, the prior year, 2019, uh, which is actually a good thing I think given the uh, the challenges facing us all with COVID. Uh, some of the other statistics there are slightly down from years past, our number of volunteers, examiners, members, and so forth. Uh, so the Alliance, I think, is holding our own despite the challenges and ready for growth again this year. Next slide. These are some of the things we're uh, currently working on that you might be interested in. Uh, we launched a new professional development series this quarter, uh, which will be um, obviously quarterly. 
featuring a different topic that focuses somewhere in the Baldrige framework. So the one that it's actually tomorrow, and I think there's a couple of seats available, is on leading and managing change. One in a couple of months is on taking more intelligent risks, being more courageous. Uh, we are co-hosting the Baldrige Fall Conference in partnership with the Baldrige Program and Foundation later this fall. You see the dates there, it'll be online. Uh, and we, we are partnering in a lot of other ways, uh, trying to advance the concepts of community excellence that Bob just mentioned, um, and building more of our own infrastructure to better support our members and, uh, and better advance the cause of Baldrige nationwide. So I think in the interest of time, Al, I'll stop there and I appreciate the uh, invitation for you to check us out online. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for all that you and all the state programs do out there as the entrance point for people interested in Baldrige. I would just like to remind everybody that the Institute for Performance Excellence does much more than just webinars, and we have training available both online and post-COVID. We're already beginning to plan classroom instruction and executive level training, so please watch for that on our website. In addition to that, our next webinar, which will be held in May after the Quest for Excellence conference in April, will be focused on community colleges, and we will be showcasing Richard Bailey from Northern New Mexico College, a organization which just won the state's highest award, the Adobe Award in New Mexico. So that should be an exciting webinar coming in May. Please watch for additional details on our website and have a great day. Thank you.